Good morning, church. Good morning, family. Uh, turn to the person next to you, and uh, I'm pretty sure you'll greet it. You, you have already greeted him or her, but just once again, say, I'm so good. That's so good that I can see you today here. So good that you're sitting next to me. You may even go ahead and give a hug. <laughs> well, uh, not going to lie, it's not the easiest Sunday to preach. Uh, and as, as you know, a few days uh, ago, we lost our brother, Mike Colchin. And if you were here last Sunday, probably he greeted you at the door. And uh, he was very intentional about serving people no matter where he was. I mean, not only in this building, but uh, anywhere. If, uh, if you knew his life, he, he was the one who would come to help. And he would volunteer, and he wouldn't count the cost of that. Um, just a couple weeks ago, I was, um, uh, I was driving a person to the airport. Uh, and uh, it's uh, like... Afternoon hours, uh, traffic in, uh, on uh, 85, I have my phone on the dash uh, with navigation on uh, because, you know, sometimes it reroutes you to uh, not, not to get stuck in, uh, in traffic. And so it uh, took us to uh, 285. Uh, kind of detour. Uh, um, anyway, so we, we're, uh, you know, driving to the airport, uh, talking, and I have an incoming call from an unknown number uh, on my phone. Uh, and, uh, and this, uh, well, that's probably me, or maybe uh, you are the same, but, you know, because my mind is very analytical, it starts, you know, calculating all the different options. Okay, should I uh, take the, uh, should I, you know, two buttons, red and green one, answer or just decline. And, uh, and I'm like, okay, should I take the call? Uh, what if it's scam? Why didn't it detect it? Because normally Google detects it as a scam or potential scam. Uh, it didn't detect. Maybe it's not a scam. Uh, okay, what if someone wants to talk about something personal? I have another person in the car. I don't want to have it on speaker. And so all these thoughts, and it's like, it's, it's the, within one second, all those thoughts, they just, uh, uh, you know, come to my mind, and my mind tries to, you know, find the best option. And while I'm, and I'm like, for, for a second, my attention uh, was drawn to those two buttons, green and red ones, with this very small decision, which was like super big for me at that moment. I kind of zoomed in. And, uh, uh, and when um, I lifted up my eyes, I saw that my lane has almost stopped. And, you know, I'm on the interstate, it's like 60 plus miles an hour. And I see the car is like super close in front of me already. So I, uh, you know, step on the brakes uh, and uh, the car is stopping. But I see that, well, I mean, there's no way I avoid the collision. So I look, and that's all happens, you know, within the fractions of a second. I look to the right mirror. No one's uh, in that lane. So I, 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 I you know, turn the, the wheel to, to the right. And I stop. So if, if it's uh, uh, that, that car, I stop, like, uh, to, to the right of it. And within, like, you know, inches. And, and that was complete stop on the interstate. And I'm for, for a second, I'm looking again to the mirror, the cars behind, they had a little more of a distance and uh, so they could uh, uh, break down uh, before that and we continue driving. And uh, I just, um, you know, sometimes uh, with, uh, with our life, we also sometimes are zoomed in into some little moment that seems like super important for us. And... Uh, and we may miss the, the bigger picture. And sometimes it may hit really hard, like this, uh, in this case, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with that car on the interstate. Uh, and today I would like to speak about uh, eternal perspective. That our life is not just 
the years that we spend here on earth. Because the Bible speaks of our life as the, as the vapor that comes just for a short time. And uh, to, uh, I got something here to illustrate it. Uh, see this rope and you see there and you might have thought like, what, what is this rope? Um, if someone can, can help me, uh, Serge, can you help me to just uh, 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 unroll this rope? Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah. So just imagine this rope, and it's just an illustration. This is your life. And uh, if, if you're not aware, thank you. Yeah, that's cool. If you're not aware, uh, our life... Uh, well, from the biblical point of view, from biblical perspective, it's, it doesn't end here while we are on earth. But it continues into the eternity. And so just imagine this, this red, pink part is our life on earth. And everything else, this is the eternity. And we sometimes... We are so zoomed in into this life and we're like, okay, I'm going to work hard in this part so I can rest right here. And that's like all I'm thinking about. Like I'm going to do that right there. And that's, that's, that, that's, all, uh, that, that's everything I'm, uh, I'm about. And our life is way, way bigger, way longer and uh, if we have the eternal perspective, it, it changes a lot of things in our life. It changes the way we approach life. When we understand that this short part is a, is a little. And here it, I mean, uh, it, it's like uh, this rope is finite. It's, it's, it, it has an end. But the eternity doesn't have an end. Okay. So I hope it, uh, it uh, illustrates a little bit uh, what I'm going to be speaking about. Um, so why is it important? Why is it important to have the eternal perspective uh, on our life? Well, first of all, because Bible speaks a lot about it. From, the, from Genesis to Revelation, that's the, uh, the Bible uh, shows us that the, this eternal perspective is very crucial. And uh, we may uh, go and like, and we can see it in lives of so many people in the Bible. And uh, uh, I would like us to go to the book of Hebrews to chapter 11. And that's the chapter where we read about uh, different people who were, uh, uh, were kind of selected by the author of uh, the book of Hebrews uh, as the people of faith. And he used their examples to demonstrate what it means to walk in faith. And in verse 8, we read about Abraham, who was called the father of faith. It says, it was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowledge where he was going. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal, say with me, eternal foundations. A city designed and built by God. So we see Abraham, he was in, even when he already arrived to the promised land, when he already had all the evidences that God has blessed him in that land, that God has uh, prospered him in that land, that he uh, protected him, that that was, that was God's plan to lead him to the land of Canaan. However, he lived as a foreigner in a tent. And why did he do that? Wasn't he uh, able to afford a, a building a house like other people did? No, he expected something different. He basically, like if that was um, in our days, uh, he would be like, a, you know, a, a millionaire, maybe a billionaire uh, that lives in a camper. He, he lived in a camper because 
he was just ready for God to call him somewhere else. What if God's going to call me? I want to be ready. I don't want anything else to hold me, uh, hold me back. So that was his attitude. And it doesn't, it doesn't say that, okay, guys, now everyone sell your property, sell your houses. Uh, we buy campers. If God is calling you to do that, then maybe you should obey his voice. If, if he didn't tell you that, don't do that, okay? So but for Abraham, the main point was that he was expecting or he was looking forward to a city with eternal foundation. So he was waiting for, for the new Jerusalem. And that was, that was his hope for something that, that is going to come, that is not here yet. And he had this, this eternal perspective. That, that's why he could, uh, he, could be, uh, he, could, he could walk in faith. Even though like God promised him your descendants going to be like the stars in the heaven, like the, the sand on the shore. He didn't see that. And by the way, the, uh, the verses 13 and 16, they sum up uh, and they say all these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. And I truly believe that when this, uh, this verse says they did not receive what was promised, he speaks or refers to their earthly life. It's not that they have never received. Because, you know, God cannot lie. He promised He's going to deliver on His promise. But if we expect Him to deliver here, then we may be discouraged. And we may lose faith. Because if we have eternal perspective, we know it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to happen when we want it. It's going to happen in God's time. And uh, they... It says, but they saw it from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and uh, nomads on here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country, uh, uh, to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country that they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared a city for them. So look at that. God is not ashamed because of that. Because of their eternal perspective. Because of their patience in their faith. God is not ashamed to be called their God. Wow, what a privilege it is. So this eternal perspective... Uh, sets us in a position where God says, I'm not ashamed to call this person my child. It's like God was boasting about Job, like, have you seen Job? Have you seen this man? So the same thing, if you have this eternal perspective, you're standing in faith, you're standing in the promises that God has given you. God says, God boasts the same way about you, like, hey, have you seen my son? Have you seen my door? And uh, chapter 12, uh, the next chapter of the book of Hebrews, speaks about Jesus. And uh, it says that because of, the, now, because of joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding the shame. And now he's seated at the place of, ha uh, the place of honor bef uh, um, beside God's throne. So... Jesus had to go through this temporary suffering while he was on earth. He didn't enjoy the cross. That was not, you know, vacation. That was not the cruise time. He was not, he, he was not you know, uh, invincible. Or he, he was like uh, pain numb. So he didn't feel anything. No, he experienced it all for us because of his love. But he, because of the joy that was awaiting for him. The joy that was way bigger, way greater. The joy that was eternal and is eternal. He could go through that and endure that. 
So the Bible speaks about this eternal perspective all the time, all the time. Uh, C.S. Lewis, he's the author of the pretty famous book, Mere Christianity. He was writing the following. Uh, he says, if you read the history, you will find that, uh, if you read the history, you will find that Christians who did the most for the present world were those who thought most of the next world. It is since Christians largely ceased to think of the other world, they become so ineffective in this one. Think about that. If we have this eternal perspective, we actually, we're not living like, you know, uh, a veggie life. So we don't do anything. We're just waiting for uh, my life here to end. No, it actually does, uh, or it just drives us to do the opposite thing. We understand that this time, this time is given uh, to me for, uh, to accomplish something. And I want to do my best to, to do that, to accomplish that. And so, therefore, he says that uh, Christians who did the most for the present world were those who thought most of the next world. Second, if you disregard the eternal perspective, it may hit you hard. And uh, um, why? Because uh, all of us, we're going to stand before God one day. And uh, we're going to stand before Him as, uh, as a judge. And uh, you just uh, hold on a sec, because uh, I'm going to explain that. Because um, uh, the, whenever we hear the word judge or judgment, we, we think of condemnation. But it's, um, it's in a little bit different context. 2 Corinthians 5.10. If you read this chapter, Paul uh, speaks uh, to or he addresses Christians in the church of Corinth. The people who were born again, who uh, experienced the salvation in their life, who have received it. And he says, for we must all stand before Christ to be judged. So Christ is going to be our judge. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. So uh, he addresses Christians, as I, as I said, and he said, we all, we must all. So he includes himself into this group of people. And uh, uh, so as I said, the judgment is not condemnation, Okay. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's not about salvation because uh, you, you cannot earn salvation. You cannot earn it with your, you know, good or uh, evil works that you've done. Salvation is not about works. It's, uh, it's a gift given by God. It's by grace that we are saved through our faith in Christ Jesus. That's, that's the only way you, you can be saved. You cannot earn it. You cannot, you know, just go to church, give tithe, uh, you know, uh, check all that, uh, you know, have a checklist with good works you have to do, and you kind of fill out this checklist, and yes, God, I'll present this to you, and I, I am saved. No, you're not saved like that. You're, you're saved when you accept the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross by faith. It's free, but it's not free because Christ paid for it, right? And uh, that's how we can be saved. And here Paul, he's not speaking about the, he's not speaking about the salvation. And uh, uh, this word that, that is used here uh, as for judgment, he, like in other translations, it, it's, it, it, um, uh, it says before the judgment seat of, uh, of Christ. And judgment is here, is the, uh, it means evaluation. It's to make a conclusion based on, uh, on, the, uh, on thorough investigation of facts. So like a, like a judge, you know, in a court makes a, makes a decision based on a thorough investigation of facts. Uh, Pastor, can I see one of those bottles uh, that you have? Like any of them. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you. Uh, so see, I have a bottle here. Uh, uh, what, what do you think is in this bottle? Water. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's water too. Uh, can I be 100% sure? Probably not. 
Uh, but if I, if I look at it, it looks like it's sealed. Let me try. Yeah. Did you hear the pop? So it was sealed. So it was sealed. It has the, the brand on it. It says uh, purified water. Uh, and uh, it looks like water. It's transparent. It doesn't have any smell, so it smells like water. And uh, it tastes like water, you know? So uh, my best judgment is that this is water. I may be, I may be tricked by someone who, you know, set it all up and put something that doesn't have smell, looks like water, smells like water. But what are the chances of that? Yeah, we have, we have been given the might of Christ. So we can come to logical conclusions based on some facts. And so that, that's called the, the process of judgment. Yeah, so we judge that this is war so we make our verdict and we act upon upon it so i uh, took a sip um, okay and the same thing is about this verse that says that we're gonna be judged by christ so he's gonna evaluate us and uh, it says by uh, good or evil we have done this earthly body and um so cross determines where we're going to spend the etern eternity. But our life in this segment of our eternal uh, existence will determine how we're going to spend it. Okay? Cross will determine where we're going to spend it. And this part, life on earth, is going to determine how we're going to spend it. And um, we're going to back, uh, we'll get back to it uh, and for and now I want to just uh, for a moment look uh, at uh, the things that uh, distract us from this uh, earthly, I mean, uh, eternal perspective. And uh, uh, if we if we can go to First John chapter two, uh, we have three verses here that speak about things that distract us, that uh, make us or uh, attempt. To make us to lose this eternal perspective. First John chapter 2 verses 15 through 17. What it says here. Do not love this world nor the things it offers you. And uh, it, it doesn't speak about uh, the, you know, the creation of God. The, all the birds. The, you know, uh, the fireflies. The... Uh, I don't know, chipmunks in your backyard and whatever. Uh, no, it, it speaks about the world more like the ways of the world, the system of this world. And, uh, uh, and he says, for when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. The, the love of the Father and the love of the world are incompatible. So it's impossible to uh, love the world and love the Father. And it's, it doesn't speak about loving, you know, people in the world, different people in the world. No, it's about the system of the world. Loving the world and to love the Father with all your heart, it's, it's impossible. Your heart's going to be fragmented. And we, uh, God has never meant it to be this way. It's like if you think of a person who's, uh, say, um, who's engaged. Uh, it would be disgusting if this person would have um, a lust after other people. Yeah? Or let alone having a romantic relationship with someone else. That would be a really bad thing, right? And the same thing, uh, the, the scripture says that if we, if we love the world, the worldly things... Then, and let the, we will read uh, as this uh, scripture elaborates uh, what those worldly things are. If we love them, we don't have the love for the Father. It's, it's being pushed back to, to the background in our life. Um, so verse 16 says, For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, 
A craving for everything we see and pride in our achievements and possessions. And those are three areas of temptation that the serpent used with Adam and Eve uh, in, the, in the garden to pull them away from the Heavenly Father. And that's the same three areas of temptation that uh, the devil used in the wilderness when Jesus was tempted. So you can, you can go and read Genesis 3, Matthew chapter 4, and, and you can see for yourself. That he used the same three categories, the same uh, areas of temptation. And he does that. Uh, he, he is an expert at using those cravings to dilute our love for Father and cause us to turn our affections to the things of this life. Uh, and... Um, these are not from the Father, but are from this world. And uh, uh, we sometimes get in so concerned about getting reward in this life. Like, what am I going to get? Uh, is God going to bless me? Is he going to uh, answer my prayers? And, uh, and that, that, happened not only to, uh, that happens not only to us, it happened to, to the people throughout the Bible. Psalm 73, Asaph, he confesses that uh, he got jealous uh, of uh, rich and powerful people and he started questioning God's justice. We uh, see that uh, uh, Peter in um, uh, Matthew chapter 19 when Jesus said that it's, uh, it's hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. They, the Bible says they were amazed or astonished at his words. And Peter said to him, we've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? He was, he was really worried. Like, Jesus, I thought uh, we, we, we made the deal. We're receiving something, actually. So I'm, I haven't just, you know, uh, forsaken my business for nothing. And so he, uh, sometimes we can have this, uh, you know, we can get preoccupied with receiving the reward n now in, in, this, uh, in, this short, in this short moment of our earthly existence. And uh, verse 17 says, And this world is fading away along with, ev along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever who pleases God and uh, God's God's love is unconditional you cannot make anything do anything to make God love you more and on the other hand you cannot do anything to make God love you less his love is perfect it's constant it never changes it never fades away his love is there for you. He loves you unconditional and will always do. That's his nature. That's who he is. God is love. Uh, however, pleasing God is a different thing. God can be pleased with us and we can do something that can grieve him. The, uh, if you read the Bible, we, we can do something that pleases God. Something that is pleasing to him. Or we can do something that grieves him and if we understand that then the things of the world they stop driving us that's not something that motivates us and like I would do anything just to get this car and my life is all about you know getting this car driving it that is so shallow my life is worth so much more uh, than that and I'm not trading it for something that has zero eternal value because uh, just FYI you cannot take anything material to this other eternal part of your life it's uh, it's good to look at life from the eternal perspective I'd rather seek the kingdom of God and all those things will be given to me as a nice incentives and uh, even if not, the heavenly reward is greater anyway. That's it. Uh, how does eternal perspective affect our living? Uh, what, what if I told you, just um, we're going back to the reward part, the judgment seat of Christ. And um, 
what if I told you that uh, the way you live tomorrow is going to determine the next hundred years of your life? How are you going to live the next hundred years of your life? How would you live tomorrow? Would you just, you know, uh, have a you know, sloppy day, would uh, be you know, lazy, wouldn't do anything actually, would uh, spend, it, uh, spend the day scrolling through you know, Facebook, Instagram, uh, half of the day, then, you know, just, uh, uh, how would you spend it? I, I, I bet you, you would do your best to make sure that you secure next hundred years in the, you know, you, you would secure good, good life for the next hundred years. I'm going to work as hard as I can today. I'm going to do everything, all the good things that I know I should do just to get this reward. And uh, it's, it's, it may be uh, a, little, a little bit simplified, but that's, that's about how, how it works when we speak about the reward. And uh, the reward we're going to get from Jesus. And uh, we, we can read about, the, uh, like the Bible says, the full reward. So if we use logic, we can assume that there is a, like a partial reward or there is no reward. It, again, it doesn't affect the salvation. You, you're going to be saved. Like 1 Corinthians chapter 3 speaks about, you know, building and someone who is building um, out of, uh, well, compares like expensive uh, building materials with, uh, with the cheap ones. The one who builds with the cheap ones, they're going to burn one day. And he's going to be saved, it says. It's gonna be... So it's not about salvation. It's about the reward there, eternal reward. And um, so uh, when we are going to be judged, we're not going to be judged only by things like the good things we've done. Like I, every Sunday I was in the church. That's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I shared the gospel. Yeah, amen. That's, that's a good thing. I, I was generous with my offering. That's a good thing. However, if we read the Bible, uh, and I would like to read just one particular verse uh, from Psalm 190, uh, 139, verse 16. Um, the author says, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. In the book of Revelations, we also read about the books, like our names are written in the book of life. The, then it speaks about the, uh, the book of, of works. And, and so, uh, and we're like, uh, yeah, well, so salvation is not about works, so probably that's some kind of misunderstanding. No, it's not about salvation, it's about the reward. And... Uh, we are going to be judged and evaluated, if you wish. Uh, not by what we have done, but what we were called to do. See, our every day of my life have been recorded in your book. So God, even before we were born, he had already written the story of your life. Dreams he had about you. The calling, the mission he, uh, he had for your life here on earth. And he knew all the days, like every day, before you, you and me, we were even born. And so he would compare what he has written, the story he had, that he had written, with the story the, of our life as it was when we come and stand before him so therefore if we have this eternal perspective and you know what it's gonna it's gonna determine the the eternity that little moment of our history is gonna determine the rest of our history and uh, it's uh, and his uh, evaluation or his verdict it's uh, it, it is um, uh, it is permanent. It, it cannot be, uh, you, you cannot appeal against that. that there's, uh, it, it's going to stand for eternity. So what the reward you're going to receive is going to be eternal. God, God's not going to change it. It's not like, well, uh, I, I'm, I'll make sure I'm, I get it to heaven and then I'll build my career with God, you know, right there. No, that's, that, that's, not, that's not the way it works. So 
uh, his reward is going for all eternity. Remember this, uh, this story that Jesus told about the master who, who, has, uh, um, who had given talents to, uh, to his servants. Yeah, and he has given them different amount of those talents. And he asked the, uh, he asked the report from them based on how much he had given them. And so the, in the same way, God's going to ask us, have we accomplished what he has called us to do? Have we accomplished the mission that he sent us for? Did we live out the story that was written before we were even born? And that's a big question for everyone who lives today. Because uh, we, we need to realize that our life is fragile. It's uh, our life is like a vapor. And uh, we, uh, if we live like life is forever, I mean like here on earth, that uh, I'm never going to die. No, that it's, it, it really misleads us. It, we will lose this perspective of eternity. And uh, it's a big question. What, uh, what has God called me for? And uh, if you have asked this question, if you prayed and you know what you're living for, where you are called to be, and not everybody is called to, you know, go to, to Africa like Brother Nikolai. Maybe God has called you to a marketplace to provide for those missions. Or maybe God has called you to raise your kids in God's way and they will impact nations that it's it can be so so different uh, because it's God's story it's not something that we can you know put in some kind of formula but one thing is super important that you uh, do you know today what you're living for what God has called you How, are you pursuing the purpose in your life that's a big question uh, I want us to, uh, to stand and we will pray. First thing is, uh, when, we ha when we get to this eternal perspective, we, we want to know the will of God. If we understand that our life is going to continue in eternity, we want to know the will of God. We want to know how He sees that. And uh, it says that God is willing for God's will for every person to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. And that's the number one thing. And maybe uh, you are here today and you're not really sure that you have been saved. And what I mean by that is that you, you, you're not sure that you have a relationship with God. You're not sure if you know Him. So if it's you, maybe you've been in the or around church for for a while, but you have never actually surrendered your life to, to Jesus. I encourage you to do this today because He has already paid the price. It is going to be free for you, but it's going to change your life forever. Let, let us pray together with those uh, who, who are watching us live or if you're here and you need to surrender your life to Jesus. Let's pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love me so much. You have given your son Jesus for me. I didn't deserve it. But I receive your gift of grace. I thank you that price for my sins has been paid. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Be my Lord and my Savior. I want to know you as my very best friend. And I want to follow you all the days of my life. Into the eternity. Amen. If you pray this prayer for the first time, I encourage you to share the decision that you've made today with uh, one of your friends with the pastors of the church, if you're watching us live, just send us a message uh, and we want to connect with you. And we want to help you to make the first steps in your new life with, with God. And the, the second big question, if, 
is uh, have you figured out what is, the, what is the will of God for your life? What is the plan that God has for your life? What is the story that God has written for your life? Maybe not the full story, but at least for, uh, for the foresee, foresee, foreseen future, foreseeable future. Yeah, foreseeable future. The, do you know that? Have you asked God about that? Are you in the right place? Are you doing the right thing? And uh, don't make hasty decisions. But if you, but if you do, do not know the answer to this question, just dedicate time to God, to spend with Him, to seek Him. Jesus, even Jesus, as He was walking on earth, on this planet, He said, I seek to do the will of God. He had to seek the will of God, to know and how much more we need to seek and know the will of God for our life. What does He want me to do in this season of my life? If, if you don't know the answer to this question, uh, I, uh, I want to pray with you. Because it, it is, this question is so big. You cannot underestimate it. If, it. if it's you, can you just lift up your hand? Don't be afraid because when you're going to be standing before God, thank you. You're going to be standing before God. Then it's, it's your friend, the person next to you is not going to be standing there with you. God's going to be asking you. If, if you know, then that's cool. I want to, I want to hear your story, like what, what you're doing and how God is using you right now. If not, let us pray together. So if it's, if it's you, if it's you, I want to pray with you. You may come forward and we, we can even pray together as, as a family here to see God, to know His will, to have this eternal perspective.